Today's episode is all about diversity. Because we've got crawling, starving, pale-skinned monsters, and we've got shape-shifting trickster creatures all lurking about in the woods. Hope you're ready. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails to hear me talk about how I've been enjoying these wintertime jazz channels on YouTube while working. Today I've got some Skinwalker and Wendigo stories ready to share with you. Enjoy, and don't forget to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them, and go to eeriecast.com to check out our other shows and to check out our merch store. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Deer Don't Hunt Horses from Boulder Equestrian 9914. I've lived with horses ever since I can remember, and I've been riding since I was about five years of age. I live in Colorado. Deer and elk are really common in this area of the countryside, where I often took my horse out for rides. I've only ever boarded my horses at barns closer to the backcountry, where there are very few cars, and I would often take my horse, Raj, out for sunset rides in the large fields behind the barn. During those rides, it was very common to see small herds of elk or deer prancing through the roads on the other side of the fence, or sometimes even in the field with us. Nothing unusual. Just the normal evening crowd along with the normal coyotes and red foxes. Truth be told, for some time I've been fascinated by the mythology of skinwalkers, wendigos, and various other cryptids, but I've never truly believed in them. I myself have never actually encountered something of the sort, nor had I heard of any sightings of such creatures, at least not in my particular area. The most dangerous animals in my part of the state are mountain lions and black bears, but usually they stayed far away from people for the most part, unless you were living in the Rockies. Because of this, I never held any fear of being out on my own in the darkness. Horses, being prey animals, are highly acute to any type of danger, so I always felt safe. However, one night in late December, something happened that will forever be present in my memory. This happened several years ago, so perhaps my memory has filled in some spots here and there, but there are some details that I will never be able to forget. Many of the horses on the farm lived out in the dry lot across from the field, including my large black gelding, Raj. There were even some larger draft horses that resided within the herd of our smaller quarter horses and Arabians, and because of the size difference, injuries were relatively common. One morning I came out to the barn as usual, only to find one of my friend's horses with a set of deep gashes along her flank, shoulders, and chest. They looked relatively narrow, and the entire herd was pretty worked up. Some of the other horses still snorted or flagged their tails in alarm. This particular horse had a bad habit of getting a little too excited, and I assumed she must have run into the barbed wire fence, since there was a small section of it in the wooded part of the dry lot that seemed to have come down. The vet was called, and she turned out to be just fine. However, as the days dragged on, the horses grew more and more agitated, especially when there were elk or deer around. This was unusual, since they were so used to having them around so often, traveling through the fields. Before long, more horses turned up with the same deep scratches as the first horse, always on their haunches, shoulders, or sometimes even their necks. For a while, we thought perhaps it had been a cougar or perhaps a starving pack of strayed dogs. Those were common around the area, unfortunately, though the wounds never seemed to truly match either of them, which was strange. We could never quite place exactly what was injuring our animals. It was both baffling and very worrying at the same time. One cool night in late December, I was driving out to the barn, as usual, to take my horse out for a ride. As I made my way up the driveway past the dry lot, I noticed the horses desperately tearing around their enclosure, tails up and heads held high. 
I looked over to see what might have spooked them, curious as to why they were so worked up, but I couldn't see much at first, other than what appeared to be a deer standing in the middle of the field. It was a relatively large buck from the looks of it. Slowing my car to a stop, I stared at this deer for a few more moments before it raised its head and looked straight at me. After getting a good look at its face, I felt my blood run cold. This supposed deer had two dark, forward-facing eyes, and it was horribly thin, as if I could count every bone in its body, yet it was much larger than any deer or even elk I'd ever seen. It almost seemed to be staring right into my very soul, and it almost appeared as though its face was more bone than fur. Its front legs were misshapen, looking more like the legs of a dog than a deer. And as I continued to stare at it, the cold fear grew like a cloud of smoke inside my veins. Everything inside me told me to turn around to get the heck out of there. Without warning, it turned and bolted through the field and over the small hill that led to the road, disappearing into the growing darkness. I no longer felt safe keeping my horse at that barn ever since that night, and I quickly packed up and moved. I'm fairly sure that that thing, whatever it was, had been what was attacking the horses in the field, but I hoped I was wrong. I moved barns soon after that, and never saw nor heard of anything like that ever again. For several months, I tried to convince myself that it was probably just an elk with chronic wasting disease, a sickness that can make a deer or elk lose a lot of weight and even give them a much more eerie appearance. However, after looking more into cryptids, I now truly believe that what I saw must have been a skinwalker or something of the sort. Whatever it was, there's one thing I know for sure. Deer aren't supposed to hunt horses. I hope that I won't have another experience like it, and now I try to avoid visiting the barn alone at night for fear of running into something like that again. Encounter with a Creature in Algonquin Park From Anonymous I'm a school teacher from Barry's Bay, Ontario. Thanks to my summers off, I spend almost half of each August going on canoe trips in Algonquin Provincial Park nearby. Most of the park isn't wilderness by any means, as there are many logging roads. There are, however, many areas of the park that are protected, which have no logging or infrastructure, and these are the areas I like most. Some of these areas are huge, bigger than most other provincial parks. This August, I went on a solo trip to Lake Lavier to catch some lake trout. It wasn't exactly the season for them, as most lake trout stay in very deep water during the summer. But I was going to have a busy fall and figured why not attempt some deep water jigging. The trip began through the access point on Lake Obiongo, a large lake with branching arms that act as a popular canoe highway for backcountry access. Over the course of a few days, I made my way from Opiongo to Dixon Lake, across one of the longest portages in the park, and up to Lake Lavier. The lake was beautiful. When you first cross from Dixon to Lavier, you enter a bay, and as you continue on your way, it opens up to a massive lake that felt like a small sea to a guy like me, who has never seen the ocean. Since this lake is very deep into the backcountry, you normally don't see many other campers. However, one of the only other canoe trippers there happened to take my favorite site on one of the islands. Because of that, I decided to try something new. I camped on the lake's northernmost site. I set up camp and went fishing. It was extremely windy, so it was difficult to control my canoe. This is less of an issue when I have the weight of all my gear in the boat, but I had already set up my camp. I decided to call it a day early, and I went back to shore before the winds blew me to the other side of the lake. It was then I had an idea. I was relatively close to a much smaller lake to the north of my site, connected by a very short and nearby portage. 
I grabbed my rod and a few small spinners, deciding to head over there to see if I could catch some perch or panfish from shore. It was getting late then, so I wouldn't be there long. I made my way up the portage only to find it connected to a very marshy area. I went back and around the marsh, which took longer than expected. I began to cast from shore as the sun was setting, not wanting to head back because of how long it took me just to get there. It was getting a little nippy out, so I buttoned up my flannel. The lake was beautiful with the cold wind. That moment of beauty was quickly interrupted by the sound of crunching to my right. The only animals that make sounds like that as they move about are bears and moose. Both are creatures that you do not want to bother. The issue was that this animal was in between me and the rest of the shoreline that would have guided me back to the marsh and thus the portage and my campsite. I decided I'd have to cut across the dense forest to the shore of La Vieille to find my campsite. I was glad I brought my flashlight because at this point it was quite dark. I made my way into the woods and after about 15 seconds I heard that animal again. I froze in my tracks and went quiet. I heard it continue for a second before pausing itself. When I continued on, it continued with me, but when I stopped, it would stop too. At this point, I was absolutely terrified. I shone my flashlight behind me, but I couldn't see any reflecting eyes shining back. I swear I was just standing there with my flashlight for two minutes. After that, I started to speed walk, shining my light back periodically in a slight panic. I didn't want to be eaten by what I thought was a mountain lion or a bear. I finally tried scaring whatever it was off by yelling. I turned around and shouted as loud as I could, back off, back off. as if I was calling out to someone. My entire world shattered when whatever it was shouted back, 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 off. back off. It was in my voice. This is going to sound absolutely crazy, but after that, I then saw a bald white head with no ears and huge eyes look out from behind a tree, and I absolutely bolted through the woods away from it until I made it back to the water. From there, I ran to my left along the shore until I reached my campsite. I threw literally everything in my canoe as quickly as possible. I picked up my tent with my sleeping bag and everything in it, and I just tossed it in the canoe. I grabbed my backpack and water filter as well and threw them in. I got in and paddled as fast as I could, completely forgetting to get my bear hang. I had no honest idea where I was going then, but every inch of my instincts were telling me to just leave. I found myself sitting in my canoe in the pitch black, not knowing where on the lake I now was. Most of my thinking was about what just happened. That night, I didn't sleep. I just waded along in my canoe until morning. Somehow, I had the gall to head back to my campsite and quickly grab my bear hang, then canoe to the other side of the lake where I would properly fold and put away my gear. Trust me when I say, I'm never camping on Lake Lavier again. Something wore my grandma's skin. From Maple. This happened just over a year ago. My dad took my siblings and I to our cabin in the woods. When we were there, we went boating, quadding, played badminton, and had a really good time. Fast forward a few days, at the end of our visit, I began to feel scared, paranoid about something, like I knew deep down something bad was going to happen. I think it might have had something to do with our discussions we had there about skinwalkers, and later remembering that saying the word skinwalker, mentioning it and talking about it, is said to draw them near to you. I confided in my grandma, telling her I was scared. She laughed and said I was just being silly. I insisted that maybe something was in the woods with us. 
but she sighed, telling me not to speak of it, especially if I'm so scared. Around 6pm, I was sitting in the room we stayed in. I didn't feel like playing board games with everyone else, so I sat there and looked out the window. That's when I saw it. It looked like my grandma, except she didn't look exactly right. Her arms were a bit too long, going down to her knees. She seemed to be taller than my actual grandma, who's really short. This wrong-looking version of my grandma was just walking around aimlessly through the woods. Then I saw her walk over to the shed and stand completely still, not moving at all. By then, I was horrified. I felt like I had to continue watching it, though. When I heard someone laugh in the kitchen, I snapped out of it. I walked back into the kitchen with everyone. My grandma was pouring some wine. I asked my grandma what she was doing outside just now and how she got in so fast. But she looked at me confused and said she had been inside the entire time. A sudden sense of dread rushed over me. I ran back to that window, checking outside, and my younger sister, curious, followed me. As we got to the window together, we saw a figure run off into the woods. The two of us thought it would be best not to speak of it, mainly because no one would actually believe us. I'm not really sure what it was, but I think it was a skinwalker. I said its name so many times and it seemed to have shape-shifted into my grandma, but still, it couldn't get it perfect. This is the first time I'm telling this story. Call me insane, but I do plan on going back to that cabin. I want to find out what it was. I'll even try to convince my family to get cameras so I don't have to go face to face with it. But now I know better than to say Skinwalker out loud in the middle of the woods. There's something like a Skinwalker in Finland. From Capitan Stark About a year ago in late November or early December, I was going on a camping trip. I left early in the morning, as in Finland, the sun doesn't come up during winter, so I had a few hours of light before complete darkness. When I left, I took my hunting knife and my hunting rifle and an extra gas can with me. At first, I was just riding around in the woods. At about 20 kilometers in, I began to smell this horrible odor. It made me gag. I'd never smelt anything so bad, despite having gone hunting for a moose every year and having stumbled upon plenty of animal corpses in the past. I began looking for the source of this smell, but I couldn't find it. As I continued on, the smell eventually disappeared. I tried not to think about it. A few hours later, I'd gotten to my campsite. After setting up camp, I decided to check the gas in my snowmobile. It was nearly empty, so I began to fill it up with the extra gas can I brought. It was getting even darker then, and colder, so I got the fire going and I began to rest. Now, the area I chose to camp at was a small clearing. I could see all around me quite well if there was enough light. There were thick woods all around me though at about 200 meters away from the camp. That's where visibility dropped. After it got dark, my fire was starting to go out, so I ran off to the edge of the woods to get some firewood and kindling to bring it back to camp. I was able to save my fire, but that smell from before had come back. I wanted to leave then because the smell was so bad, but it was too dark and cold now. If I didn't keep an eye on the trail, I would get completely lost, so I decided my best bet was to stay put and just endure the smell. Over time, I realized this stench was getting worse, but then the smell stopped increasing, so to say. Quickly, I grabbed my headlamp from my bag and put it on. My heart sank as I scanned the nearby woodline. I heard the voice of my cousin, who should be a hundred kilometers away from here. As I continued to look around, I saw a red eye glint at the edge of the woods. 
I decided then to pack up and leave. But right before I was able to start the snowmobile, I heard fast and frantic footsteps in the snow, and something yanked me off the snowmobile. It began to drag me into the woods with incredible force. I had my knife on my belt, so I grabbed it, and I began to stab at the thing's hand until finally I struck something and it let me go. At the same time, a horrible scream like a woman and elk combined filled the air. I still had my headlamp on, so I glanced at the thing. What I saw looked to be a half-rotten wolf-like creature running away from me. I was absolutely dumbfounded. It had only been dragging me for several seconds, and yet it had dragged me quite a ways into the woods. I began running back to the snowmobile. When I made it, I began pulling on the cord hoping it would start. When it did, I sped off. I went a bit too fast, losing about half of my stuff as it flew off the snowmobile. I still had my rifle though. I was going way too fast on that small trail and I began to hear more screaming around me as if there were more than one of those things. Worse yet, they seemed to be keeping up with the snowmobile. I had to have been going around 80 kilometers an hour. I made it to a long straight stretch of the trail, so I locked the gas on full and grabbed my rifle, firing a shot at one of the figures I saw in the woods that was screaming. I hoped I hit one of them, but I don't think I did. At one point, the screaming just stopped, but I kept driving home and after about an hour of riding, I finally made it. I ran inside, locking all the doors and windows. I think I passed out eventually, because I remember after that, waking up the next day at 10.26 a.m. I grabbed my rifle off the ground and went outside to check. Everything seemed calm. I checked my snowmobile then. I found a patch of pure black hair stuck on the hook at the back of it, and I saw these huge claw marks on the back too. I began walking back to my house, and I saw that there were similar claw marks on my front door. These things had followed me home. But where were they now? They know where I live, but luckily to this day, I haven't seen, heard, or even smelled them again. I haven't told anyone about this encounter because skinwalkers or wendigos aren't supposed to be a thing in Finland. Every time I hear the voice of my cousin, it just brings me right back to this terrifying trip. I've stopped hunting as much anymore, and I've moved closer to the nearest city, Rovaniemi. I still don't visit the forest to this day. That trip really scarred me. Skinwalker at Scout Hall from NG Foxy 666 When I was 10, I did scouts with my friend, Joe. On a certain occasion, Joe and I went to the scout hall for a video game night sleepover. All the kids ate pizza and drank soda while Joe and I just played in the corner. Joe was my best friend, though our interests weren't exactly the same. We still got along. As it got dark, everyone began to watch a movie. I honestly can't remember which movie it was. Joe and I were mostly just quietly whispering in our own little corner. Soon we got up to get a couple of slices of pizza and some soda. I remember only grabbing a couple of slices because pizza always made me feel sick. After about half an hour, I started to feel sick anyway. I got up and asked Joe if he would come outside with me to keep me company while I got some cool night air. Now, our scout hall was a wooden cabin near some trees, but there was a highway and a water stream not too far from there. The back door, which was the one Joe and I went out of for some fresh air, was facing the forest. That night it was very cold, but it was also refreshing. We stood outside, talking and looking out into the forest. Joe was telling me something about our friend we both knew, a girl who lives on his street and my primary school bestie. Suddenly he just stopped halfway through. 
Then he whisper shouted at me. Did you see that? He asked. Uh, see what? I questioned. That, he replied, pointing to the three trees really close to each other nearby. I squinted and looked really close and waited for about 15 seconds. When I finally saw it, a pale shadow darted from tree three to tree one. What in the world? I said in disbelief, chills covering me. Then it happened again. It moved from tree one to tree two, then back and forth, going in no particular order. You saw it that time, right? Joe asked again. Yeah, I did. We should head back inside. We might get in trouble if we're out here too long anyway. I said, not taking my eyes off those three trees. Joe agreed with me, but we were both high up in the scout unit, and the leaders would call us if they really did need us, or if we were really not meant to be somewhere. The rest of that night was uneventful, until everyone went to sleep. Joe and I lay awake, whispering quietly about our lives. We lived about one kilometer away from each other back then, and it was about a 15-minute walk from his house to mine, but it was like we could talk and talk forever. Then, at exactly 11.36, we heard knocking. No, it was more like tapping. Long fingernails tapping every few seconds in a rhythm, with a second pause between each one. Tap, 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 tap. At the window across from us, the orange streetlight nearby from across the road made it almost straight out of a horror movie because we could see the outline of a humanoid shape near the window. After about 30 minutes of just lying there still as a rock in our sleeping bags in the hall, facing each other's terrified expressions, it stopped. Then we heard what could only be described as feet. Four bare feet, pitter-pattering away, but yet no blood-curdling scream. About ten minutes went by, and we were both still frozen in shock, fear, and disbelief. What was that thing? Joe asked, but I had no answer. No words would come out of my mouth. Tears ran down my cheeks, and I just wanted my mom and dad or anyone to get me out of this place. Finally, when I had my voice back, I tried to talk, but suddenly, we heard something from the direction of the forest. I think it came from the stream. A scream so loud yet distant. Needless to say, the two of us did not fall asleep. The Hunt for Entities From Daniel 7 SE Back in August of 2021, I began to hang out with a couple of guys my age named Nick and Bell. One day we decided to go for a bike ride to a graveyard down the road from their house. Five minutes later, we arrived at the graveyard and got off our bikes. It was just the three of us in broad daylight. Nick and Bell walked over to sit on some random person's grave that dated back to the 1800s. I told them that was disrespectful, and to get off the grave and pay respect for it, but they said they didn't care, and laughed about how they were going to go to hell anyway. After that, they made it worse, starting to jump on the graves. I had a really bad feeling about all of this, and I suddenly felt as if I was being watched from the corner of the graveyard, as they carelessly played on the gravestone. I told them that I wanted to head back to the house. I didn't feel right. And that was the end of that experience. When October came around, we started to explore abandoned houses in the area. Eventually, we got bored of that, and we would play truth or dare outside during the late nights. We even did some 3am challenges we found on Google, which I deeply regret. Bell's brother, who I'll just call Chris, was a very interesting guy. He would often tell me about all these paranormal entities and legends and myths, but I really didn't believe him when he said that they were real. One night in December, Bell and his brother and myself gathered around on the back deck of the trailer, 
Belle's brother Chris was telling us about a native word that the natives used to summon skinwalkers to their location. He dared one of us to go into the woods and say the word out loud, but we were all too scared to do it. So I said, how about we all say the word together? And we did. And the moment we did, I instantly felt a chill go over my whole body. We stood on the back deck then, listening for any sounds, when out of nowhere, we heard what sounded like me and Belle having a conversation in the woods. That sent us darting right back into the house and locking the door behind us. A while after that in November, it was a Tuesday night. We were on our way to pick up my mom's car, so she could go to work tomorrow. She was tired and staying over at a friend's house, so we offered to get it for her. She gave us the okay and the keys, and me and my friends were off. We made it to her car and I got in, putting the key in and starting it up. I pulled out of the driveway and picked up my friends at the woods by the house. We drove around the block and into a back road, which had a 45 miles per hour speed limit. For some reason, I was going almost 70. But then as we were driving, I spotted these three deer on the side of the road. There was something very strange about these deer. I almost hit one that ran in front of the car, but as this happened, it was almost like it happened in slow motion. The deer that ran out in front of us seemed normal, but the little one on the side of the road was kind of strange. I saw it stand up on its two back legs, and I swear I saw it change from a deer into what appeared to be a blonde girl with sharp teeth. We sped to the house, and we called it a night after that. February of 2022, the weather had begun transitioning from winter to spring. Chris and I decided to go to the nearest field to see if we could catch a glimpse of the thing that's been following me on camera. I brought with me a knife, a baseball bat, and a GoPro. Chris had a BB gun and some crappy headlamp. We soon found ourselves in the field down the road. We went into this bush and picked a spot to hide and wait. Several minutes went by, and it seemed like whatever we were looking for knew we were looking for it. What I experienced that night I'll never forget. As the two of us were sitting in some bushes under the trees, we heard what sounded like 20 deer running around us like something was trying to get at them. And then, once that noise stopped, we heard what sounded like a huge bird flapping its wings above the tree line. While we were listening to that, I pointed out that something was coming at us from deeper in the woods. We heard breaking branches and trees being pushed over. Chris and I, beyond intimidated and terrified, booked it out of there. Once we exited the woods, all the noises just stopped immediately. The woods were as quiet as they were before we got there. We decided to call it a night and we went back to the house. As we left that field, I glanced back up into the tree line and I saw these four glowing orange eyes looking back at us. Chris said to just act as if we didn't see anything. We were walking down the street and I turned to look back and I saw this lady in a dirty white dress. I pointed it out to Chris and he stopped to look too. As we stared on, the lady in the white dress made a terrifying scream and began to sprint at us. Luckily, we made it back to the house safely. Who knows what would have happened to us if it had caught us. My dad saw a skinwalker. From Silver Bullet 54. My dad is a real macho guy. Even at 60 years old, he's still about 6 foot 2 and weighs between 200 and 220 pounds. He has been in the USMC, worked at a prison, and has never been afraid of much. Maybe death and God, but that was it. He also used to scoff at the supernatural and paranormal, saying it was all total BS. But his trip to Dayton, Ohio changed his mind. While he was in Dayton, he decided to just stop at the first place he could away from people, 
since traffic is one of the things he hates. When he did, he got out a horse blanket and pillow, curled up in the bed of his trunk, and went to sleep. It was a warm and clear night, so it was quite relaxing. While sleeping, he was suddenly awakened when he felt something bump into the side of his truck. He sat up and began to look around, but he didn't see anything. This happened three more nights in a row. He would stop at a secluded location, sleep for a while, and be awakened by the contact of something hitting his truck. Fed up, he took out a camera and tripod he had with him and put it up right next to the left side of his truck, since that's where all the bumps were coming from. He pushed record and went to sleep. At 4am, he woke up and decided to check his camera. He watched for hours and saw nothing until 3.30am. All he could manage to see was what looked to be a pair of feet walk up to his truck, stop, stand completely still for a minute, then walk away. The freaky thing is that it was just feet. No legs, no knees, no hips, no torso, arms, head, nothing. He searched around the area but saw nothing out of the ordinary. On his last day, he stayed up all night thanks to monster energy drinks and a fervent desire to know what the heck was going on. At 1.15am, he heard something walking towards his truck. He looked up and he saw something that sounds even worse than anything I've seen myself. He said it was at least 10 feet tall, with black hair or fur, with red eyes. He thought he had to be dreaming, so he tightly shut his eyes for a moment, then opened them. He felt like he was right in front of the creature. He felt that if he turned to look behind him at the right side of the truck, he would see that thing standing there staring right at him. So instead of turning, he sat completely still until the sun came up. Then he hauled Tell out of there. When he got back home, he told me never to visit Dayton for any reason. Now, I haven't been to Dayton at all. Still, his experience does intrigue me. What did he see? Is it still there? What was it? To this very day, I have not gotten an answer to any of those questions. Those are not my friends. From Edo Custom I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, and three of my online friends, Chad, Josh, and Emily, were coming over from Cleveland, Ohio. Chad and Emily were cousins and had some grandparents who lived in the neighborhood. They would be over for the weekend and decided to bring Josh along too, as he lived nearby and also wanted to join us. On Saturday, I was playing Oculus Quest 2, like I usually do when I don't have homework. I don't go outside a lot and mostly play video games during the winter, because it's kind of like a break for me. Cross country ended a month and a half ago, and I'm doing track in the spring. My dad and sister were watching Christmas movies in the living room, and I was in the basement. I was in the middle of a game when I got a notification on my phone. I wondered who it could be. I walked over to my phone and didn't know who it was. For some reason, I forgot that my friends would be here, and I usually forget to put contacts into my phone. But the text said, We're at the door. Come on out. I was confused and went upstairs, looking out the window when I saw them. I opened the door and came out to greet them. Then we walked around the neighborhood just talking and messing around. It felt weird because usually I talk to them on Discord and FaceTime. It was nice to hang out and meet Josh in person. I met him a year ago and we've been friends ever since. I had met Chad in person a few times before, so it wasn't as weird as with Josh. I've known Chad since I was 10, and he's probably one of the best friends I have. It was very awkward to see Emily again in person because a few weeks before this we broke up, but we're still friends. We were talking and hanging out until 8.30pm. Then they had to go and eat some dinner. I went back home and about an hour later I went for a run. Now, I don't like going on runs, but my dad makes me do it. That's when stuff started to get weird. 
When I was almost done with my two and a half mile run, I was happy with my time and almost beat my personal record. I was walking up the driveway when I saw this dark figure at the bottom of the hill in my backyard, which is connected to the woods. The figure looked to be about six feet tall. At first, I thought it was Josh, who was six foot one. I called out to him, Hey! hey. Then I froze. All of the limbs on that shadowy figure began to twist and I could hear an audible and loud cracking sound. It sounded kind of like when you crack your knuckles over and over again. Immediately, I bolted for the door and locked it behind me. I remember suddenly getting cramps because I just finished the run, so my mad dash to the door made me cramp up. My chest and legs hurt too, and my heart felt as if it was about to bust open. My dad walked up to me and asked if I was finished with the run. I told him that I was, and I walked upstairs to my office, sitting down at my computer. Look, I didn't want to tell him about the thing in the backyard, because it would sound so bizarre. So I took my mind off of it by playing video games with two of my other friends, Ben and Seth. We stayed up until around 2am playing online. I did tell them about the encounter and of course, they didn't believe me. I went to bed after that, and I woke up only a few hours later. Nothing weird happened that night except for a bird hitting my window. My dad and sister had to leave to do something that morning. I forgot what it was. I wasn't paying much attention because I was still focused on what happened the previous night. About 20 minutes after that, my friends came back. I told them what happened and surprisingly, they believed me. Chad then reminded me about something else that happened in my backyard. It was about two years ago. Chad was over. The two of us were hanging out in my backyard, looking for an albino squirrel my dad said he saw earlier. We looked for a few hours until we actually found it. When we saw this squirrel, we were amazed. We'd never seen anything like it, an all-white squirrel with these red eyes that looked like tiny red buttons. The squirrel looked at us, and instead of running away, it just stared at us. Then the craziest thing happened. Its head just kept twisting and twisting before it fell off the tree. We looked down where it fell, but all we found was blood. No squirrel. I thought it was so weird. The memory of it just felt more like a dream. But when Chad reminded me about it, it came rushing back to me so vividly. However, Emily didn't believe that at all. Later, we wanted to play some virtual reality game together, so Josh and Chad went to get their VR headsets. Emily asked me to show her where I saw that shadowy figure. I took her into the backyard, and I pointed out where I saw it. She walked over to the wood line, trying to see if she could see the thing herself. The idea of it still being out there was frightening. I thought it was strange, but I decided to accompany her as she went along. We walked until we ran into Josh and Chad. That was weird, because I just saw them going to get their headsets back at the house. They were all just staring at me. I got creeped out when their mouths slowly began to open more and more. Then I saw their teeth. They weren't normal. They were too jagged and sharp, more like needles than teeth. Jack, come here. We want to show you something. Josh said to me in the weirdest voice I've ever heard from him. I told Emily we needed to run, and together we did. Behind us, a loud, ear-piercing scream filled the air. We heard them running after us. Strangely enough, their feet sounded more like horse hooves. We ran up the hill, and just as we got up there, Josh and Chad were back. At first, I was horrified, but when I realized they were startled by us, I knew it was them. I told them what Emily and I saw. I looked back down at the things I thought to be Chad and Josh before, just staring at us from the woods. When I turned back to the real Josh and Chad, I could see them paralyzed with terror. 
They were not looking at the monsters. They were looking at me. Jack, what do you mean Emily was with you? She's not here. I froze. Who was with me in the woods? I looked back to where Emily was, and she wasn't there. I turned around and looked down at those things, and she was with them, standing right next to them. I saw her head begin to twist, just like that squirrel a couple of years ago. We ran inside my house, locking the door. I began to wonder, who had I been talking to out there, if Emily wasn't here? I know it wasn't just me, because Josh and Chad were talking to her too. But when I asked them about it, they said it was just the three of us out there. We looked back out the window. We could see them running back into the woods. When we thought it was safe, we walked back to Chad's grandparents' house nearby, just in case Josh grabbed a knife. Once there, Emily came back with Starbucks. She looked at us confused, wondering what happened. Why do you guys look like you saw a ghost? She asked. It was worse than a ghost. We explained we saw these things that looked like her and Josh and Chad. What she replied almost made me soil myself. Well, to be honest, I swear I saw someone that looked exactly like you, Chad. But they were way too tall, and their face looked as if it had been burned. This person stared at me through the window of the car as we drove home. Chad's face looked even more pale than before after hearing that, and they left a bit early because of this. I've talked to them a few times since these events, and we tried to tell our other friends, but no one really believes us except for a friend named Adam, because apparently, Adam said that he saw something like that himself, something that imitated his younger brother. We haven't bothered to tell anyone else, a few days ago, Josh, Adam, and I looked into it a bit more, and we think what we saw might be a skinwalker. But we can't be sure with something like this. Hunted From Country Rebel This is an old story told by my grandpa before I was even born, but one night he told it to me. A bit of background, he and my grandma live in the woods of Washington State. My parents and I visit them from time to time. A few things about my grandpa are that he is a country type of guy and a storyteller. I always loved listening to his stories. One fall weekend, we went to visit them at their place. We would always talk about how things are going and old memories. At night, I would find my grandpa sitting in his chair outside. That night was no different, except this time, I saw him sitting there, staring out into the woods like something was out there. Something on your mind, Pops? I asked. He then sighed and asked me in that old southern accent of his, Son, you believe in the supernatural? Not that I know of. Why? Well, I encountered something a long time ago before you were born. I figure it's time I told you this story. He said this in a serious tone. All right, I'm listening, I replied, kind of excited. He then started his story. It began when he was going on a five-day hunt alone in the woods. He had packed everything he needed for the trip. His weapon of choice was his lever-action rifle. Once everything was packed, he kissed Grandma goodbye and drove off to his hunting spot. As he drove through those woods, he swore that he saw shadows in the trees. Not just any shadows, but weird humanoid figures. He brushed it off, thinking it was some hikers. Once he arrived at his spot, he set up his camp. He then began hiking through the brush and looking for tracks of deer, elk, or moose. Grandpa knows the wilderness like the back of his hand, so he didn't worry about getting lost. A few hours of walking and making some calls, nothing came across. That's when he started to get a feeling that he wasn't alone out there. He noticed that the birds and insects suddenly went quiet, and he knew when the woods went quiet, it meant that a large predator was around. He thought maybe it was a bear, 
wolves, or a cougar. He waited a few minutes in silence, but still nothing came by. He started to walk back to his camp as the sun was beginning to set. Eventually, he made it back, roasting up some marshmallows, then going to sleep. The next day, he went back to the woods and continued where he left off. Not long after, he stumbled upon a cave entrance. He didn't venture into it, fearing there might be a bear inside, so he continued hiking for a while. Soon, he smelled something. Something he described as rotting flesh and muck. It made him want to gag. Then that feeling came back of not feeling alone anymore. He proceeded to keep on walking to get away from the smell and that feeling. As he walked, he could still smell that stench no matter how far he went. It seemed like the smell was following him. He then told me he began to see movement in the trees. He readied his rifle just in case, but then everything went still and he could hear murmuring like someone was talking low. Eventually, he could make out what it was saying. John. It was saying his name, but the voice sounded more like Grandma. Jess? He called back. Help me. I'm hurt, it replied. My grandpa was both scared and confused. He felt something hard hit him in the back of his head then, and he swears he blacked out for a moment. When he came to, he was surrounded by complete and utter darkness. Quickly, he scrambled for his phone. At the very least, the screen on the phone would provide some light. He felt a jagged rock all around him. He was in a cave, and his head was pounding. Slowly his eyes adjusted somewhat as he crawled along the ground, feeling with his hand, trying to see as much as he could with his phone screen. Then his hand bumped into something. At first he hoped it was another rock, but this felt smooth. When he picked it up, he nearly screamed. This wasn't a rock, it was a human skull. He began to look and search around more, finding untold numbers of bones, not just animal bones, but human bones too. He had never felt more horrified. He then heard a screeching sound. It didn't sound like a man, only partly. The rest of that scream sounded like an elk. He was so scared, he needed to find a way to defend himself. Luckily, he found his rifle. He grabbed it and hid behind a large outcrop in the side of the cave. He began to hear heavy footsteps approaching the cave. He took out his phone, trying to make out what it was. Then he saw it. It was no ordinary animal. He described it as looking human, but whatever it was appeared to have not eaten in months. He could see its bones through its skin. Its arms and legs were so long and thin. It had hands like a man, but its fingers ended in claws. He swears he saw something like a bony tail. As for its head, that looked more like a deer's skull, with sharp canines at the front of its jaw and human-like teeth at the end of it. There were antlers on its head running down its back, and its eyes seemed to glow in the darkness. He had no words to describe what he was feeling then. The thing spotted him soon enough, and my grandpa fired at it. The creature began to screech in pain. It jumped on him, pinning him to the ground and opening its maw. That horrible smell came out of it. My grandpa then latched on to one of its large fangs and yanked until the fang came out. With one rapid movement, grandpa stabbed the thing in the eye with its own fang. It fell backwards, but my grandpa followed through jabbing the thing more and more until it stopped moving. Only then did he breathe a sigh of relief. He made his way slowly and steadily to the entrance of the cave. Then he made his way back to camp, packing everything and making his way home. When he got back, my grandma saw him in a complete mess. She tended to his injuries while my grandpa told her everything. She was in shock. 
When he finished telling his story to me, I asked him, Whoa, so he really killed it? He then pulled something from his pocket. This, this is all I brought back with me that day, he said. He gave it to me and told me that that was its fang. Well, did you ever find out what it was? I wondered. Well, son, I did learn its name. Some folks call it the Wendigo, and I'm not the only one who encountered one. Poor souls who are unfortunate became victims of that creature. He answered. Surprisingly, I believed him. Word of advice to you. Don't go following voices in the woods, especially the ones you know. And listen to your instincts, because it might as well save your life. You hear me? I nodded quickly. After hearing my grandpa's story, I had many thoughts running through my mind. But if I find myself in the woods, I'm going to recall that advice. Never follow the voices. Follow my instincts. Understand that I'll never know if I'm being hunted myself. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.